anyway, we were on the box, and I remember, um, I remember talking about stopping the box cars and defecating on the uh, on the side way there by the railroad station on the at the uh, openings there. And they were screaming at us. I said, "Well, you know what? This is like this crazy guy down there." All right. Anyway, we're we're shitting on the railroad stations and we are throwing out the buckets of pee in six days. And a lot of guys stepping on each other. And uh, at any rate, we arrive at Nuremberg uh, about the 5th of February, somewhere in that area, the first week in February, we arrive in Nuremberg. When we arrive in Nuremberg with those layers of Red Cross parcels, uh, I Still at age 74, never having learned to be uh, that greedy, took my parcels and gave them in to, uh, as part of the general distribution, not realizing it was the only food in the whole damn camp. And self-preservation is, is the, uh, whatever it is, is, is the, is the uh, is something. So anyway, I gave away food that I should have stolen you know, that we brought down to these guys, you know, because a lot of guys did steal them and they, otherwise we had to rely on absolute zilch. So, uh, at any rate, there was absolutely nothing to speak positively about Nuremberg. It was infested with fleas, with every conceivable type. I'm surprised the whole area didn't come down with uh, typhus or typhoid or whatever you want to call it. It was formerly the, uh, the uh, prison camp of Italians. Uh, the Italians became the enemies of the Nazis, of course, when, uh, when Mussolini was, was captured and when he was uh, de dethroned and uh, Bagdolio, I think, Marshal Bagdolio uh, was uh, brought back into the picture. And he was a, um, uh, a hero, leader of the Italians. So naturally, all the Italian allies were thrown into the prison camp. And I guess they weren't the cleanest of people. And anyway, they, they didn't have any garbage. They buried their canned food or whatever it was a few feet below the ground. And it was a bloody mess. And, we had to have a lot of enlisted men come in and clean up the place for us because we were officers. Well, we cleaned up our own individual areas, but the general compound. But, uh, uh, as I say, our big feature was, was the weekends when we went in and got a hot shower and got deloused and then immediately got infested again because we, we tried scattering our straw uh, that was, those were our blankets. Were these were these palliasses, These uh, stuff. Uh, Matt, what was that stuff that's made in India? The uh, the uh, sisal or uh, uh, no? It's um, it's a material. It's a uh, hmm, gunny sacks. What do they call them? We call them gunny sacks. I don't know what the hell you call them out with it. But it was uh, anyway. You stuffed those with the straw, and that became your mattress. But to me, what difference? You, you spread them out, you know, spread the straw out, but they were still fleas in there and flea eggs and whatever you want to call them. And it was just delaying things. So we went from day to day. Uh, we would get issues of some kind of um, soup. Uh, somehow or other, they scrounged up some Red Cross parcels. Anyway, uh, the Americans. We lived, and uh, we got through February, we got through March, and uh, I met my friend Tom Thomas from Wheaton, Illinois. I met him in there again, the one that was in the West Compound. It didn't make any difference now. We were there. It seems that the group, the group that uh, uh, were marched out ten days earlier from Sagan 
they eventually got so far and they disintegrated and part of them were waiting for us to bring some food in at Nuremberg and the others were already at Moosburg, which was outside of Munich. If you remember, we were in Munich and uh, your, your Gene said to me, you want to go see uh, Stalag? It was only about 10 miles away and I said, absolutely not. It was one of the great memories of my life. So, uh, there were not all there, so as I say, there was no such thing as a compound. You, find, you slept where you could and then you finally organized yourself and uh, there was some form of organization and Tom Thomas was in one barracks, I was in another, but there was no different compounds. The English had already been shipped north to the Baltic Sea, so we lost track of them altogether. The, the British, the, 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 one, the, the remnants, the remnants, like, like 5,000 remnants of the ones that had been captured and shot in the Great Escape. They were up by the Baltic somewhere and they, they had their own commanders or whatever, but they, these were the balance of the Americans. And they were still shooting them down, we still get remnants every day of people coming in from, the, from, their, from, their, from, their, from their sorties that parachuted in. And, uh... But you were still, it was, you were still, obviously you were still prisoners of war. Oh, of course, but, and, you know... And how, but how, how did you, did you guys feel like that, what, how was the balance of the war going then? You felt well, like we knew time. that it was, it was just, look, Patton was on his way. And the uh, fact that the Russians were coming in the other way. The Russians were coming, but we were, to the, we were way to the south now. You see, we were shipped south uh -huh. because Hitler toward Austria. Uh, Hitler still had several uh, uh, aces in the hole. For instance, uh, he had... Uh, Patton's son-in-law. Uh, Patton married to Patton's daughter and uh, he was a POW. He was a colonel or something like that, an Air Force type, and he was in our camp. We didn't know who he was or what because uh, they kept these guys. And then there was Churchill's son-in-law. So I was in a camp with the VIPs near Nuremberg, but uh, he was going to grab these guys and take them to his mountain retreat near Salzburg. I think you were aware of it. We didn't go up there. But uh, we were there and every night we would be subject to a bombardment. Now uh, we'd be subject to the greatest bombing assault on the city of Nuremberg that anybody could imagine. We were about five or six miles away and we dug slit trenches. But in the meantime, they had our camp marked out. And every night they would come over, the, this is the Royal Air Force, they would come over and they would mark out the camp with flares. Amazing the way they had that thing marked, uh, you know, uh, blank, uh, marked out. And then they had anti-aircraft guns either in the camp or nearby the camp. And uh, I got to the point where I wouldn't go out uh, into the slit trenches anymore. I, they certainly didn't come in looking for you. In the, you know, the Germans they were busy shooting at the uh, the planes. But uh, what happened is that the shells, the remnants of the aircraft shells would fall as they would explode. And some of the guys were hurt rather severely with these remnants falling from like five miles or three miles or wherever they were up there. I said, the hell with it. I said, if, if I get hit by a bomb, it ain't going to, I mean, the slit trenches are near enough, it's not going to help you any because these were these were uh, six-ton bombs. These were 12,000 pounders. Wow. And uh, so as a result, there were, uh, there were no uh, possibility of, of surviving any, any miss anyway. In other words, if they dropped anywhere near our camp, close, uh, we'd be goners. 
So at least I don't, let me get hit by the big thing, not the little sh uh, shrapnel, that's it. That shrapnel is what I was thinking of. So, so we, uh, I stayed inside, I was, you know. And uh, if we were eating, I'd finish my meal and maybe somebody else's when they weren't looking. But uh, at any rate, we were at this Mooseburg and it was hell on wheels. And uh, no, this was Nuremberg. We hadn't got to move yet. We were at Nuremberg, Nuremberg, uh, and uh, while we were inhabiting the uh, inhabitants of that camp outside the town, and between the the daylights, the Americans used to come over, you know, with real high level bombing at the RAF at night, seventy five thousand. Germans were killed by the bombing and it was the most unbelievable sight the night bombing the day bombing was nothing they would just come over and you'd see the smoke and, and then you'd start shaking but the night with they, they they dropped Christmas tree flares would light up you could read a newspaper it would light up the entire town and uh, then they would drop the big one and it would hit. I don't think there was any attempt at guidance or, or anything. They just, as long as you had fins on it, so it, I guess to give it some guidance, because we were only five, six miles away. So that part of town that was close to us got a break, I'm sure. But at any rate, that thing hit the ground. And then you would count. I'm guessing maybe a mile a, a sec, uh, a mile a second, somewhere around there, because you would count one one thousand, one two thousand, one three thousand, one four thousand, one five thousand, and then the whole air, the air would just shake and vibrate and everything else. It was the most horrible feeling in the world. And then what had been there was it was evaporated, just gone completely. And this went on for, for night after night after night. But it didn't end the war. And so finally, uh, they came to us. We're getting lists. Uh, these uh, POWs, uh, and of course this was the Wehrmacht. We were not under the Luftwaffe anymore. We were under the German uh, ground forces, der Wehrmacht, and uh, they came around with dogs and with tablets and pads and pencils, and they said, uh, Tannenbaum, wollen Sie uh, fahren zu spazieren? That means fine. You want to take a ride in the plane in the trains? Like we did before, do you want to? Do you want to walk? Do you want to march? Well, come on! It was it was April. I mean, you still needed a a, a GI overcoat in April, and uh, you know you needed your uh, your heavier khaki clothes. We didn't have different Palm Beach style uniforms, but uh, I said. Mirville and Mirville and uh, uh, Spitzer, we want to walk. So we started up. I don't know, twenty thousand, and we took what we could carry, and then uh, we would stuff a blanket down each side of the pants. We, for a pack, we would have a pair of pants tied, both legs tied, and then a piece of rope where the belt is, and then you, you loop it around your, sh your shoulder, and each few minutes you would stop and change the, the belt, I mean change the shoulder position. So uh, anyway, uh, we'd go on, and uh, the first night we made 20 kilometers. I have never walked 20 kilometers in one time in my life. Okay, so what happened was that uh, uh, 
as far as the guards were concerned, first of all, there weren't 20,000 of us very long. Gradually and gradually, the cripples, like myself, I didn't have chillblains anymore. Thank God the chillblains had healed or whatever happens to chillblains or whether scars or calluses. And, uh, but, uh, and of course, I didn't know that I had, uh, that I had uh, uh, problems with my neck uh, vertebrae. So what would, uh, we, we had probably a company of guards for 20,000, maybe two, 300 guards. And then what would happen is that as we kept falling back, uh, less and less guards were, there were about 102 of us were really crippled up pretty good. And we would just keep falling back. And when they called, okay, uh, Spitzer, you know, let's go. Uh, we just didn't go, we didn't get up, we waited another half hour or so and then gradually, gradually we separated ourselves from the main body. We were in no hurry to go anywhere, it was a lovely April uh, countryside in, in, uh, in Bavaria, the most beautiful part of Germany, the Black Forest, the Schwarzwald, we weren't near there, but uh, at any rate, uh, uh, what would it, what would happen would be that uh, that we would uh, we would uh, rest and then finally I got up a routine where we would take the uh, uh, we would take one of our guards uh, we became a small group of 100 120 guys. Varying, some guys maybe took off, you know, in the countryside, but there was nowhere to go between us and General Patton, who was following us up with the Third Army, was the SS. And we certainly didn't want to get mixed up. One or two guys escaping, boom, boom, you're dead. I mean, they ain't going to mess with you. So, because obviously you committed a civilian crime, because you remember in one of the previous uh, sessions, the Germans told us they couldn't be responsible anymore. And of course, this wasn't even the Air Force, it was the Wehrmacht, and they were a bunch of bastards. So, at any rate, here we go, and we're on the road, and we finally found a little village. And uh, I said to the one of our guards, we had six of our guards, and we carried their rifles for them. First of all, they emptied out the rifles, they emptied out the magazines and put the, put the uh, cartridges in their pockets, that is the Germans. And then they gave us the rifles to carry. They were in their 60s, the old coppers. And uh, so I said to our guard, if Braden see near the, uh, uh, the uh, oh hell, the mayor, the, the uh, Meister, the, whatever it was, the, the head of the city. Uh, I'll think of it tomorrow sometime. So the guy came and he said, and I said, uh, Guten Morgen, Guten Tag, whatever it was. I said, I said, uh, you've been Amerikaner officer. I says, uh, Luftwaffe. I said, Schnell das Krieg is farting. The Krieg going to be over, the, the war is going to be over pretty soon. I said, Mir haben uh, 100, 120 uh, Amerikaner Soldaten, Luft, Amerikaner Luftwaffe. Uh, I said, Sie geben uns eine Platz zu schlafen. You give us a place to sleep. You, you know, uh, this is high class Yiddish. It's, it, that's all it is, but it's a form of German. And you, you give us, uh, I don't know why I'm talking German to you guys, but at any rate, um, you give us a, a place to sleep, you know, a hayloft or something, you know, and uh, you, uh, you know, give us food, and God did they have food. They had pumpernickel loaves the size of, of your automobile wheel. They had cheese, cheddar cheese, or whatever kind of cheese, Swiss cheese, any kind of cheese you wanted, also the size of, of an automobile tire wheel. And uh, ham, bacon, all oh, this is, you name it, uh, milk, butter, huh. 
those Bavarian farmers did not go hungry. So they and I said, oh, and I said, you give us some paper and I'll write on the paper that you're great guys, that you've taken care of American personnel and that you've been kind to us and I will not only have the government supply you with funds to re with American money, but I said they will they will they will not shoot you, they will not harm you. Oh yeah, yeah, bring the paper because that's all they knew of these 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 horrible SS coming in and killing people, you know. So I wrote down and I said uh, to commander of the U.S. forces. I said, uh, please be advised that this town, this city, and the Burgomeister, the mayor, Herr Schultz, or Herr whatever his name was, have been very kind to American personnel, and uh, please treat them kindly and reimburse them for all the food that they've given us, and they've given us an awful lot. Signed, Harold Tannenbaum, First Lieutenant, Air Corps. And we took a liking to this little town. I think it was called Freiburg. And we stayed there for about two weeks. We had no place to go. And as, and as a matter of fact, I was billeted in the home of a widow. And uh, Frau Rosa Schwarzer was her name. Pretty good after all these years. And I never did, she, she must think me to be horrible, but I never sent her a couple of dresses because I lost her address and, uh, and I forgot how the hell to get it there in Germany. And who knows where she was. But uh, at any rate, she, she, we slept in her barn. There were about uh, 20 of us or something like that. And uh, she said to me, come into the kitchen, I want to talk to you. You know, she offered me the use of one of her bedrooms, but uh, one of the rules uh, was for enemy soldiers not to cohabit with German women, and me being a Jew, that's all I would need, you know. I said, pass. I don't know if you remember uh, uh, the, uh, what was it, uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, where this guy picked up a little, ga a little porcelain gadget and he was shot immediately. Or didn't you see the movie Slaughterhouse-Five? Uh, no, really. Kurt Vonnegut. Mm -hmm wonderful movie and book. At any rate, I didn't want to get caught, so anyway, I was very polite, very nice, and kept my distance completely. And so she, she called me in, in German, and she said to me, come in and sit in the kitchen, I want to talk to you. Uh, Lieutenant Harold, she called me, Lieutenant Harold. So I said, yes, Rosa, what is it? And she said to me, I thought it was just the Nazis that were anti-Semites. And I says, why do you ask? She said, uh, oh, by the way, uh, two other Jewish guys and myself who helped me scrounge for all these fellows, also Jewish, out of Brooklyn. One guy was uh, Harold Iskowitz was a relative of some people in, in Rock Island. And uh, the other one was uh, Herbert Corwin. Now, before the war, there was a famous radio writer uh, by the name of Corwin. I can't think of his first name now. Unfortunately, it'll come to me later on when it's too late. Uh, Corwin and Iskowitz and myself, I would instruct them how to talk they weren't very good in Yiddish, and they 
and I, and and they would uh, go out and they arrange for things. So she said, I thought it was just the Nazis. And she says, why is that? She says, because three of your men, all of a sudden they were my men, and uh, and she says came to me and she says, why are you so nice? To these three guys, don't you know they're Jews? And she says, I knew the Germans, uh, the, you know, the Nazis were anti-Semites, you know, anti-Semites. But she says, your own men that you've been feeding. Well, you, can you imagine your 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 own man? The the uh... anyway, I went to the senior officer. I think he was a captain. I'm not sure. I don't remember. And he was furious, and so he called the guys together. And I said, uh, oh, God, I was furious. I said, I have been feeding you bastards. And I said, one of you men, or two or three of you, went to see Rosa Schwarzer and asked her why she was so nice to me when, when, uh, when uh, I was, did she know I was a Jew? And I said, I thought I made it perfectly clear to you gentlemen that I was a Jew. These were all officers. I said, I'm going to tell you something, fellas. I said, I'm through scrounging for you. I said, you're on your own now. So the captain says to me, he said, uh, he said, uh, Tannenbaum, he said, uh, he said, I'm not going to say anything. He says, because you've got a perfect right. But he said, I would appreciate if you stick around and help us out. He said, you've been, he says, He's going to make a commendation to me or something like that. I says, and I said, okay, fine, you know, I, so I said, so I, we didn't take off. So you had your options. You could do any damn thing you wanted to on it. As long as you were headed south, we didn't know at the time that we were headed for it at Mooseburg, Germany, another prison camp. So, um, at any rate, the next day, when we, we got up and we looked around, there were several of the gentlemen missing. And they know, and guys that knew them knew who they were, but they were, you know, I didn't know them. I didn't even know to, even to speak to them, you know. But that's life. But uh, at any rate, uh, so um, time went by. And we kept marching, you know, making deals. I think I even I even sent Iskowitz into a monastery, and uh, he went in there, and we got some milk and eggs and stuff, and we cooked our own little deal. And we always found a place to. Of course, April. A lot of times we'd sack out on the take a blanket out, and we'd sack out on the ground. You know, you're the camper. Harold Tannenbaum, camper. So uh, finally I said, uh, look, I'm tired of walking. And Patton's got to be awfully close. And I said, let's hop the next Red Cross. See, the Red Cross uh, were bringing in uh, parcels from Switzerland. They'd, um, they'd go up as far as they could, you know, to where, the, where the SS would stop them, they couldn't come any further, and they'd turn around on the same back routes. You see, we were not allowed to use the, you, you've seen the autobahns in Germany. Well, uh, these were the back roads that we were using, and uh, so they were not, we, so they, they would turn around, and then as they saw some GIs, Amer they would drop off a couple of Red Cross parcels here and there, you know. And, then they'd pick up any hitchhikers that wanted, you know, the, the big white trucks with a big red cross on them, so the Americans wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, uh, you know, strafe them. Uh, there were no German aircraft by this time; they were they were pretty well gone. So, uh, at any rate, uh, we uh, we hitchhiked. We got on one of those trucks. And they took us into Mooseburg, into that prison camp, where it was absolute havoc. And uh, we had little cookers that we made out of coffee cans and stuff. You put little scraps 
and you made your own little blower or something, you made a little, and that, I don't know, you heated up a can of sea rations or whatever it was. And uh, there was no such thing as sanitation. I don't think we were there over three weeks and all of a sudden in he comes. Mr. Blood and Guts himself. In where? Into our camp. You were in Ms. Mooseburg? Yeah. Did you explain? You just finally, oh you said you hitchhiked? Into, we hitchhiked and they took us into this Mooseburg camp. Uh -huh. And uh, it had been some kind of an organized camp, but it just it disintegrated under all the thousands of POWs that had passed through there or whatever it was. It was very close to one of the extermination camps, that's all I can tell you. But, but before Patton got there, had, had the, the Germans abandoned you? Not yet. Time. I need okay, now, when the three of us, uh, and almost immediately we were split up, uh, Tenenbaum, you go to this one, uh, uh, Corwin, Norman Corwin, Norman Corwin. I think he wrote Lights Out, if I'm not mistaken, or that might have been somebody else. But he was a great half-hour uh, radio uh, script writer, you know, half-hour radio plays or an hour radio plays, Norman Corwin. Lights Out may not have been it, uh, it could have been somebody else. But uh, uh, at any rate, we were split up, but uh, we became good friends. We talked to each other all the time on the phone. I think they're both gone now. Maybe not. But uh, at any rate, uh, yeah, there was some sort of an organi a camp organization there because don't forget that some of the brass from uh, uh, American POWs were sent to, uh, to Mooseburg almost immediately to, uh, to uh, I don't know where Colonel Goodrich is, I don't see, I don't remember seeing him anymore. And uh, 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 so there were brass down there that to organize, you know, an organization where they had a senior American officer and where they they had to have some kind of discipline or the whole thing would have been uh, just a rabble. But they organized themselves and uh, some of these senior officers had taken instruction and so on. And um, I don't know what they did with General Vanneman. I don't remember what happened to him either. There are several books out on uh, Stalag Luft III and what happened and I did have them and I don't know where they are now. I think there's some paperbacks for ten bucks in the stores uh, about uh, what happened uh, in, in Nuremberg and Mooseburg. But uh, here we are now, we're in Mooseburg, Germany, down toward the Swiss border, and near Munich, and uh, so uh, I think about three weeks went by, three weeks or more, and then uh, Patton uh, was so close that you, we didn't even bother with the BBC anymore. And uh, so uh, I remember I woke up one morning and I, as usual, I had the GIs. I either had diarrhea or I had uh, uh, plugged up. Uh, constipation. Constipation. It was never a happy meeting with me. And I was stuck in the uh, in the uh, abort, in the toilet, and we had dozens of, of uh, one-seaters, you know, in old, like, stone houses and stuff like that. And it's lucky they were because I could hear, I could hear gunfire I got here bullets peppering the walls, and I'm busy sitting on what do you call it, uh, trying to do my business. And all of a sudden, it's a great, it's a great uh, silence, absolute silence. And what had happened is that the night before, the uh, 
main German organization had surrendered the camp at such and such a time the next morning. And they didn't, you know, it could be that they didn't have enough people to organize to tell us all this stuff. But, but there were, it was, the organization was very bad, naturally, and so we didn't know what the hell was going on, the rank and file. And I assure you, we were plenty rank. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we, as I say, we were going about our business, but several hardcore SS guys got a hold of a couple of submachine guns, uh, these, these pistols, you know. And so they tried, they put up a last minute fight, so I guess they had to kill them. I don't know what happened to them. But anyway, that was all the noise that was going on. And then the uh, personnel were outside with tanks. And so uh, I don't even remember a big tank gun going off. I guess they were afraid to hurt some of the uh, POWs inside. But all of a sudden, uh, we were, uh, people went by and say, everyone back to your quarters, stay in your quarters and uh, do not leave your quarters. There was a big noise going on. And, and uh, all of a sudden, the, the, I, we were in tents, and the tent doors would, would, would fold open, you know. And here comes this huge red-faced guy. I guess he was about 6'2", and very high-pitched voice, very high-pitched voice sounded nothing like George Scott. Uh, well, I, well, I see, I don't want to make a, you know, I don't want to uh, create, uh, make fun of the man because he was a fantastic general, uh, especially as long as it was your blood. And uh, he said it was the finest group of men he'd ever met in his life. And you should have seen uh, I had my pants tucked in my socks, and I, I think I was still wearing my GI shoes that I had been issued on the island of Vis. Seemed like a hundred years ago. Actually, it was it was less than a year. And uh, here he is, General Patton, and. Uh, he said to us, he said, well, he says, it's going to take us a while to get things straightened out. In the meantime, we'll get some food in here, and Red Cross girls. And uh, so now, he says, you, you're, permitted to, uh, you're permitted the use of the area. In other words, you can wander around the, the grounds. And uh, so uh, everybody, of course, was delirious. I don't know if anybody had any liquor, but if they did, it was gone pretty fast. And all of a sudden, a guy gets up on a tank. Oh, the tanks are in the yard now, by the way. The tanks are in the yard. And uh, nobody for them to shoot at, so they got rid of them. But before they did, a uh, guy jumps on top of the tank, and he says, I'm a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. He says, are there any Chicago land, Chicago land people? I said, uh, how about Rock Island, Illinois? Would you consider that? He said, oh, yes. So I said, well, what about Davenport? So he said, oh, yes. So I gave him my name. So about two days after the Stalag camp fell, uh, my parents knew that I was uh, that I was uh, a free POW, free POW. So my mother writes a letter to Congressman Martin of uh, you know of our district, and uh, she had, as you know, my mother was a great letter writer, and uh, so when I got back to Davenport uh, a few months later. I find this letter waiting in a box of souvenirs for me that she kept. And uh, the letter said, Dear Mrs. Tenenbaum, I am so happy that you just found out that your son Harold has been liberated as a POW. 
However, he says, I'm very sorry that we can't do anything about your cigarette allowance. The reason. Yeah, I mean, your cigarette, she, was, she wanted to know, if, now that Harold was free, could I get some more cigarettes to sell in the store? Oh. Oh, you know, she didn't want them. She to she, she, sell in the store. Cut. All right, uh, something that just occurs to me is that is that uh, when Bill Perlstein, I thought I had discussed this, maybe not. Uh, Bill Perlstein used to take me to dinner all the time because I could he, he could get me into the places where they had decent food. Then you'd started that story yesterday. And, but did, I guess I must have, uh, you know, uh, digressed. But what happened is that I evidently must have had a date with him that night to eat dinner uh, in Foggia at one of the main officers clubs and I didn't show up. So he goes to the telephone to call my squadron. You know, this is Captain or Major Bill Perlstein. And uh, where's Harold? Ten where's uh, Lieutenant Tenenbaum? Well, sir, he his plane was shot down, and there in in flames, and there were no parachutes observed coming out of the uh, coming out of the of the of the ship. So it must be so assumed that all people on board were uh, KIA killed in action, and that's how it's being reported. To the uh, to the come uh, uh, to the Air Force, you know, to the uh, Secretary of uh, uh, Secretary of War, and uh, so Irv Perlstein somehow or other he gets this information to Rock Island to his folks, Bill Perlstein. Irv has just come back from his training in New York, Long Island. He was at uh, Camp Totten, Fort Totten, New York, New York on, on Long Island. And uh, he was being sent to Japan. Or no, he was being sent to the Philippines. That's right, the Philippines had been captured already. This was in 45. This was in 45. It was it? No, 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 no. It was not in 45. It was in 44 because I was shot down in July 26 of 44. So this happened. He came over to see my folks shortly after the Perlstein family got the message. So getting back to the uh, to the war, we. Uh, we're back there, and Patton naturally took all the German guards off the barbed wire and put on GIs. Well, we knew damn well that we weren't going to get shot at by GIs for, you know, for anybody that wanted to go AWOL, take off, you know. But where are we going? We got the Americans, now. we're in the custody of the Americans, why would we want to go anywhere, you know? looking for trouble, haven't got any money. So what we found each other again, the, the three Jewish musketeers, Corwin, Iskowitz, and Tenenbaum, we found each other again. And uh, we hitchhiked a ride to, an outs to the outskirts of Munich, where they had a big storage depot. They set up a big storage depot with thousands of loaves of white bread and uh, you never tasted anything, angel food cake, anything tasted that good, the white bread and cookies and uh, everything you could possibly think of, canned food of all kinds, you know. So what, what I did is I don't know where I got all the energy, I, I don't think I've been that unlazy since and uh, I went to the uh, commander of the, uh, of the, of the uh, storage depot 
and I introduced myself to him. You know, we, we were still in rags. You know, we had our we had our POW clothes on. You know, I had a little uh, aluminum type uh, on my stock. I had one of those um, not a stocking cap. Yeah, it was a little tiny bill, and the rest of it was a knitted cap. I don't know. You've probably seen them. You know. Uh, uh, they called him something, a helmet, a helmet stuffer, I think. Not a helmet liner, because that was hard plastic. This was a soft job. And uh, at any rate, I said to him, I says, can we, I says, we're down at the prison camp. And I said, we haven't had food like this for a while. I says, can we borrow a uh, four by four or what, what the hell, whatever else it was. And I said, uh, can we bring this stuff back with us? Absolutely, Lieutenant. Go ahead. This guy probably was a uh, captain. I don't remember what his rank was, but anyway, uh, I really had a ball. And we came back through the front front gate this time. We didn't have to sneak over the barbed wire. We came back through the front gate, and we stopped inside the front gate, and we started passing out this stuff. Well, we could if we if that constituted the the uh, voting uh, assembly of the United States, the three of us could have been president, vice president, and secretary of state. Boy, were we something! And then gradually, what happened is that uh, they lined up some um, airplanes. Uh, C-47s, uh, C-47s, uh, DC-3s, did we see, have you ever seen a DC-3? Flown on. Flown on. <laughs> PBA Airlines. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, they lined up several dozen of these DC-3s. And they had bucket seats, but we lined up buckets and buckets, and just, instead of 21 passengers, I think they got about 30 on the, on the, you know. And so what happened is 30, 35, who the hell remembers? They were stuffed, and of course they contained it. They contained no gas to speak of. It was just a short jaunt from where we were over to. Um, Reims. Yeah, Reims, France. That's where we were, Reims, France. Was it Europe? A couple hundred miles, you know. So uh, they took us over there and then they lined us up in formation, ha ha, and uh, we were to go into the shower stalls. This was the racetrack at the Reims, at Reims, France. And I wonder if you know what province, what section of France Reims is in. What kind of earth they have, and what kind of product they grow. Champagne. Well, here is this. What, am I right? Absolutely. And we, here we are in the jockey club, the jockey d division of the, of the, um, of, of, of the racetrack, uh, of the uh, fair, uh, the, the stands, uh, the, 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 where you watch the races run. Uh, the, grandstands, yeah. Huh? The grandstands. Grandstands. And you're down in the basement because of the, uh, uh, that's where the jockeys, evidently, when they got through racing the horses, they went and got weighed in or whatever it is, and then they went and took their showers. So there, what were the, well, how many how many jockeys? Twelve jockeys. Maybe there were, sometimes with a steeplechase, you got 20 horses. All right, so they had 20, 25 shower heads. So they made maybe three, four guys go in together. They weren't worried about morals at this particular time. So in the meantime, some guy comes out with a grin on his face 
And here are a bunch of jerks. You know, we don't know what the hell we got. And he brings out, like this, he brings out a bottle like that of, of champagne, and it's got a shield on it. And God knows what date that champagne was. And here are these crazy guys down there waiting to take their showers. And though they took all our clothes away from us, we were as, we were as naked as jaybirds. They took all our clothes, had a big bonfire on the outskirts. And as you went by, you throw every item you owned on, on the uh, outskirts. Then you went and got yourself a haircut. And, uh, and I'm talking about all over your body. You've got a very, very close crew cut. And uh, took all your hair off. Then after you took your shower, they inundated you with DDT. Absolutely inundated. And you were just standing there. Your hair was covered, your face, your body, underneath your arms, just loaded with DDT. And, and we were absolutely, we didn't know whether we were coming or going because in between the fizz fights and just gobbling down that warm champagne, we ruined the complete uh, wine cellar of, of, the, of the racetrack. I don't think they ever got over it. And because some of those bottles were pretty, uh, were pretty uh, uh, dirty and had uh, stuff on them. Even though I guess they had a turd of every year or so. I, when they storm, don't they have to, or I don't know any much. And anyway, that was an experience we'll never forget. <clears throat> and they dressed us up in uh, some new summer clothes. And uh, off we went to, um, there was Camp Lucky Strike and Camp something else. No, I guess Reams was the, uh, was, to, and then we went, we went to La Havre uh, afterwards, but we, I don't remember about Reams at all. It doesn't leave too much of a, all I know is that we got cleaned up. We got deloused, and uh, we, uh, to this day, I don't remember having a bug on my body. I'd better not. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we get to a place called Camp Lucky Strike. That's near La Havre, La Harve, as they used to call it. I don't know. It's the it's the port shipping port uh, where the old uh, Queen Elizabeth and Queen Mary's used to used to uh, embark and uh, anyway they uh, took us there and they had us on a bland diet bland diet no salt no pepper just food, you know, and good protein food. You know, they didn't have these supplements like they have today, but, you know, uh, stews, chickens, uh, stuff that wouldn't make you sick when you, when you took too much of it or something. So. And we were there, and, of course, while we were in rings, you know, whatever in May sometimes, while we were getting deloused and ruining the wine cellar, uh, the uh, peace pact was VE Europe was signed May 5th, 6th, something like that. I don't remember exactly when. Maybe it was June. I don't even remember that. So um, we're, we're, we're there in Reims in, in, uh, in La Havre and putt, 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 putt. Here comes the great man himself, the great crusader, Ike. 
and I wish I'd have paid more attention to see whether or not Kay Summersby was with him or not. Kay Summersby, Summersby was his driver in England. And according to some, she was, uh, if you look at Mamie, <laughs> she was much, well, she was much prettier and younger than Mamie. All right, so now here comes Ike. And of course, this man, uh, I think the, the, the second coming of Christ, I don't think, would have been any more spectacular than, than the ovation that this man got from, I don't know how many scores of thousands of men were at this camp waiting to be sent home. So uh, he gets out, he gets on a uh, makeshift stage, you know, some cartons and stuff, crates. And he said to the, and he said, uh, and this is in his book, uh, Crusade in Europe by Dwight D. Eisenhower. I don't have it anymore. I got rid of all my books. Um, he said, uh, gentlemen, I'd like to go home earlier. And of course, yeah. yeah. He said, uh, well, he said, I've arranged to have double bunking. In other words, uh, at five, five uh, uh, layers of bunks from the floor to the ceiling. And uh, can you imagine how comfortable? And he said, five layers of bunks. And he said, um, half the time, eight in the morning till eight at night, one guy owns the bunk. Eight at night till eight in the morning, another guy owns the bunk. That way, he says, we can get you home twice as fast, and uh, we can uh, utilize, and he said, we don't have to worry about zigzagging or overloading the boat because peace has been declared. And he says, I don't think there's too many Japanese submarines in the European waters going home through the northern route, you know. Uh, through, uh, so I said to myself, I have got to go home double bunking, and I said, I'm within a hundred miles of Paris. So anyway, that can't be. Forgetting the fact that I was an officer, I was a first lieutenant, I wasn't going to go in a bunk. I might go in a State room. I might go to state room with a bunch of bunks, but I wasn't going to double bunk like that. I was a, I, you know, I keep forgetting that I was an officer. You know, I didn't get four years of West Point, and believe me, it's a difference. You, they, there's that certain off, officer's bearing that you don't let go of a West Pointer. And I think Virginia military BMI. I think that's the same thing applies to, anyway. So, uh, oh, they were just thrilled to death. I went down to the, uh, I went down to the uh, sergeant in charge of the, uh, of the food, the mess sergeant. And I said to the sergeant, I says, I said, I cannot guarantee this, I said, but I promise you that if there's any way I can get you a hundred bucks, I said, how long do you think you're going to be on duty here at this station? He says, probably for the next three or four months. I said, okay. I said, here's my name, Harold Tenenbaum, uh, 1914 Bridge Avenue, Davenport, Iowa. I said, I don't know what I'll be doing or where I am. But as I said, if I miss you, I said, I'm not going to take, I said, I'm not going to take yours because I'll lose it. But I said, you write this down, you're organized, you're a, you're a mess sergeant. I said, I'm only a first lieutenant. <laughs> I had gotten promoted, I already mentioned that. I says, but take my name and address down. And I said, if you're not here, when I come back, I said, I owe you a hundred bucks. Just get me on a truck going to the uh, vegetable market in Paris. 
So anyway, he came down and uh, there was no problem. He just uh, rode up to the, uh, to the gate. He said, this officer is going to be my representative at the market. I said, I'm giving him the, uh, the money for the food, you know, French francs. And he says, here you are, Lieutenant. And he gave, you're, you're hereby in charge of this food, okay, of this money. So he gets out of the truck and Sergeant says, okay, pass on, you know, because I didn't have a pass. He said, the truck will be back in the morning. So anyway, uh, he gets out of the truck and I'm in the truck and I take off. And, uh, okay, I said, uh, and then the truck stops about uh, half a mile down the road. He gets back in. He says, okay, let's go, fellas. So anyway, uh, they dropped us off at, uh, at uh, the market, you know, in, in Paris, and, and the, the, the truck driver, uh, I guess whatever he went to do, I didn't ask his business, but he was supposed to be back there at a certain time. And it was just getting light. And I didn't have any money. I didn't have any ID. Yes, I did too. I had my dog tag. My dog tag. I even, got my, I even had my dog tag with my German POW number on it. It's in one of those drawers. Did you see it? I had my, had my dog tags. And um, so I uh, had a bowl of soup, uh, French onion soup. He bought me a big bowl of French onion soup, which certainly was not unspiced and I didn't throw up. And I don't think I've had a bowl of onion soup since that I've liked. I guess it was just nostalgia. At any rate, then he showed me, I, I hitchhiked away, because we, I was a considerable away uh, from the, uh, oh, you were in Paris, the, across the street from the opera in Paris is the, uh, is the American Express. Well, your sister knew it. But in those days, it was the Red Cross. And uh, it was about 6 o'clock in the morning. And uh, I sat down. You know, I found myself a newspaper or something. And I sat down in front of the front door of, of the Express and fell asleep. First thing I know, some gal is shaking me. Hey, Lieutenant, uh, yeah, whatever it is, what the hell's going on here? You know, what are you doing here? And I got up to her and I said, uh, you work here? And she said, yes, we. And I said, okay, fine. I said, I opened the door and I said, I'll come in and talk to you. And I told her, I got out my dog tags and showed her the German. And I, oh, oh. And uh, so anyway, she uh, got me fixed up uh, with an ID card. She got me fixed up with a pass for, uh, I think, three weeks. And she signed. Uh, I went to the three different hotels. A week each. That's all a guy was allowed. See, uh, got a, I got a, I, I got a room booked at the Creon, which is on the Place Concord, and I got a room booked at the Hotel Hotel uh, Le Galerie or something like that. There was a department store there, and there was a hotel named after it, and I got to stay a week there, and then a week. One week somewhere else. Meantime, my family here. I've been here. here I've been uh, rescued. You know, but I got no money to uh, send a message yet. So for a few days there, I was I was A W O L from my family. They didn't know where I was. So uh, finally, I uh, got some money.
some money. But I, I think I got a thousand dollars American in French francs. <laughs> yeah. How'd you do that? Went to, went to the finance department. I had my ID now. I had a year's, I swore that I had a year's pay coming. Uh -huh. Well, just a minute, Stephen. I was a, uh, I think I was getting about six, seven hundred dollars a month. First lieutenant, flying pay, uh, uh, whatever pay, you know, overseas, stuff like that. So seven times twelve is, is what, eighty-four. I, I had, uh, in my papers it shows that I had X amount of money coming, but I had already taken out a thousand dollars. I think I did that over a period of three weeks. I don't think I did it all at once. I probably did 300 one week, 300 the next week, and then the final week I had a bunch of francs with me, which I exchanged at the finance department at, when, I, when I finally got on the boat. And uh, so I spent that, this, this lady was, uh, about 40 years old, and she uh, uh, she got me a PX card. She got one for herself, and uh, she uh, identified herself as Mrs. Harold Tenenbaum, and uh, she would go to the PX with me, and. Uh, Got all kinds of fancy doodads uh, and stuff. And, uh, of course, I paid for them. And uh, after the way she treated me and fixed me up, uh, who, who was I not to? Uh, and uh, she treated me very well. Took me home to the family. She older, she was uh, about uh, 42, I think. That's about it. So I finally got on a uh, boat, uh, and there were six of us. Went back to the um, went back to the uh, camp um, Love. Luck, camp Lucky Strike in Love, and there was the sergeant was still there organizing the, the mess hall. And I said, is the food still as chicken shit? He said, yes. I said, it's fine. So anyway, uh, I gave him his $100, you know. I said, I'm a man of my word. Here's your 100 bucks. And um, anyway, I went down to the personnel, whatever it was. And uh, said, Tannenbaum, he says, I've been looking for you for three weeks. <laughs> I says, you want to put me in the brig? I says, I've been in Paris for three weeks. He says, oh, he says, forget it. He says, when do you want to leave? I said, the next boat. He says, there's one leaving this afternoon. He says, get your gear ready. I says, it's ready. Here it is. So he gave me a berth in a, in a stateroom, you know, and uh, with five other officers. And... Uh, I met a uh, I met a Lieutenant Cecil, Robert Cecil, who died of he had a cancerous tumor of the brain. He died about the same time Bill Perlstein did, or maybe a couple of years. No, by God, he lasted into the fifties. And uh, but. Uh, when I came uh, to, to Phoenix, uh, I introduced him to the Pearlstein girls. The, the, the guys weren't back yet. Uh, uh, Phil Barkin, well, that's, that'll be another story, but remember Bob Cecil, who incidentally was also an anti-Semite before I met him and turned out to be one of my best friends. I don't know why I, don't, well, I, don't know why I meet all the anti-Semites. I guess because there's so many of them. <laughs> anyway, and we had a wonderful time on the boat, six days coming in, 
and we came into um, we came into Hampton Hampton Roads, Virginia, something wrong, huh? Uh, Norfolk. Norfolk, Hampton Beach. What was the name of the boat? Remember? The it was a Liberty boat, the SS. No, why? Just wondering. Can't remember the name of the boat. It would be if if my if I'm lucky, my papers might show it. I doubt it. Though. It's a uh, was this passenger ship uh, tr the transport? It was or? a converted uh, Liberty craft. What's uh, a Liberty craft? That was one of Henry Kaiser's boats, sir. Real cheap, put together. I think they put them. They made they build them in two and, and weld them together or something. Uh -huh. And uh, real cheap ship. They put they they uh, broke them up for scrap after the war. Built them for the war. For Built the, for the war. Transport. Yeah. yeah S S. I don't. Know. And uh, so we had six days on the Atlantic. In this was June of 1945 and for six days we didn't see a wave like mirror for six days the ocean most unbelievable trip I've ever had in my life and uh, so we get into Hampton Roads and uh, anyway Hampton Beach Norfolk and by this time, the bands are playing a little weakly. <laughs> W-E-A-K-L-Y, weekly. They're getting tired of these guys coming home already. So, And they put us on a, on a troop train. And uh, by God, I was on the troop train with Bob Cecil. And it was easier for me to get off I think the way it worked out, I could get off in Chicago, Illinois, check in to uh, Great Lakes Training Station, but it wasn't Great Lakes, there was a Fort Sheridan, Fort Sheridan near Chicago. Check in to Fort Sheridan and then, uh, and then get my, uh, I automatically got 90 days leave, POW leave checked into Fort Sheridan, and uh, then I gave them all the information and they were, they were to mail my return to active duty to 1934, no, 331 18th Avenue, Rock Island, Illinois. If I'd have put down, you would, on some of my military papers, you will see Rock Island, Illinois. That was the Tenenbaum market. 331 18th Avenue because 4th Avenue, no, 18th Street, 3rd Ave, 4th Avenue and 18th Street. Uh, the reason for that is that I think I'd have had it gone to Omaha or, or somewhere pretty far, farther away than, than Chicago and that way why it'd take me longer to get home. This way, Big deal. I reported back to, to Fort Sheridan and wherever, and then went on my way. So uh, I got home. Must have been, there were more people in, in Davenport train station. At trains, there was more people at the station down to welcome me than. Uh, there were at Hampton Roads to welcome the whole damn boat. <laughs> oh, the big hero is coming home. Yeah, quite. Didn't you talk to somebody about being in the crowd that came down to to uh, welcome me back home that time, or don't you? Maybe I don't remember who it was. I think it was a Janet, Janet Sinkoff, uh, when she went down to see you in Florida that way. When, mm -hmm. when you were in Florida. All right. Anyway. So now I'm home, and uh, I'm home, and I'm down to about 160 from 200, because I was fat when I when I uh, uh, when I was captured. I weighed 185 pounds, 
and I, <clears throat> I don't think I'd had a decent breakfast yet, or or lunch or dinner. And I don't remember. Oh, and that oh, and that's after uh, that's after a week of conf of uh, con confinement and uh, solitary bread and water. I weighed 185 pounds. I could have easily as have lost 10 pounds in the week. Well, what about the time I was in that hospital? You know, I didn't eat very much then. You know, in the germ. You know, while my neck was being repaired and my my uh, my arm. So I easily could have been a 200 pounder when I was captured. And uh, so I was down to 160. By the time I got through with uh, that year of captivity, almost. All right, so then I'm home, and what do you do? I can't. I civilian clothes were unbelievable. I mean, you could. Uh, I had went down, got a couple of pairs of cheap slacks, because I knew I'd put on weight again, and uh, so therefore I had to keep. I had to wear my uniform most of the time. Matter of fact, I was supposed to anyway. So I had um, I had a uh, summer weight and I had a uh, winter weight, which were almost close to, and that's the way I uh, I dressed for the next uh, for the next three months. So I went to Dubuque. I went to Dubuque and. Uh, see my cousin Dick and I went to Minneapolis to see uh, my uncle and aunt. you know you met some of them the Uncle Mike you know, Uncle Sam and uh, you didn't meet the, the guy Uncle that Mike his, I met huh Mike I met Mike you met but Sam you've seen pictures of the two of us look very much alike and uh, just spent three months cocking around 90 days leave and uh, so this was June, July, and August. Did I get? No, I got 90 days. I'm pretty sure. And was was faded, F E T E D. You know, big hero. You know, trying to stay away from uh, the supermarkets as long as I could. I think I went over there once or twice. That's about all. Didn't show him too much courtesy, and of course I got I got furious anyway when I went over to the Rock Island Argus and saw all the dozens and dozens and dozens of pictures that they had put in and articles about the hero Harold Tenenbaum fighting for country and and and, and the God and country and. Uh, then it came time to report to Miami Beach for reassignment. So uh, I get on the train and go to Chicago, and uh, I guess what had happened is I'm, you know, I'm confused, and some of this is obviously not correct, but I mean well, and uh, as a result, uh, I was assigned to Miami Beach. And uh, and then I was to uh, be reassigned somewhere. I don't know Japan, whatever it was. I mean, I you know, an experienced navigator. You know, I was worth my weight in gold. And the B twenty nine. We were starting. Let's see. We we hadn't uh, used the A bomb yet. And we hadn't even. Uh, this was June, July, August. I don't know when the... Uh, it was like August the 11th or something. Was that a day bomb? All right, time. All right, uh, take off for Florida, get into Miami Beach, and uh, we're assigned a uh, hotel room. Uh, instead of twin beds, there are four bunks. There are... Uh, uh, double bunks, uh, top and bottom, top and bottom, were in place of the twin bedrooms. 
and we're assigned and we start going back to some orientation and lo and behold um, the uh, whoever is in charge some colonel gets on to the orientation stage uh, about the second or third morning and he says gentlemen we have to give up these hotels along Miami Beach it's getting toward winter time now and he said all these Arabs that own these hotels and in those days he wasn't talking about guys with burr nooses on their heads uh, they, uh, they want their hotels back like the uh, Roney Plaza and all these, you know, they, they all were taken over by the Air Force, but the half the war being over, they just, they decided nothing doing. So, and, and wait a minute. War in Japan had been uh, the uh, BJ, BJ-45. I think that that was um, around August, wasn't it? About the 15th. Okay, this was after v, uh, Victory Japan. So what in the hell were they going to do with all these millions of GIs that were, you know, that were, that were all set to go to Japan? And so as a result, they said, we are going to have to take you all back to San Antonio. And would, would you believe that got to San Antonio, and I ended up in the same barracks that I, that I was assigned when I was a civilian and came in and changed from civilian to, uh, to a, uh, a cadet. And this was uh, 1943, this was 1945. My God, was is it possible that only in two years, less than two? All right, it's not important. Yes, it was forty-three to forty. Oh, about three years. Same barracks, and um, so I just went around accumulating points. Uh, the the more points you accumulated, the quicker you got out of the of the Air Corps, and. Uh, I had gotten a preliminary physical examination. Uh, evidently, I was okay, had a little flat feet, and had uh, some sinus trouble or uh, allergies. Ha ha, as we all know. And uh, other than that, uh, there was nothing to hold me, and I had humongous number of points. And how'd you get points? Uh, for being in the for the years of service, overseas service, combat service, prisoner of war service. I mean, it was un unlimited the number of points I had. I think ten men could have gotten out on the number of the in the using the minimum and taking that and dividing it into the number of points that I had. Ten men could have gotten out instead of one. I am all set to get the final boom and get one of those little ruptured ducts they call them and for your lapel button. It indicates you were, a, you were a veteran. You wore that in your civilian jacket lapel. I am a veteran. And uh, I'm standing in front of a staff sergeant. I am a first lieutenant. And he says to me, Lieutenant, I don't see any physical examination here at this base. I said, I didn't see the need for any. And neither did any of the people I talked to. I said, let me tell you something, Lieutenant. You have had 47, 48 missions. You've been injured. You ditched an airplane. You hit, you hit the silk. He said, "You've been through literally hell." 
And he says, let me warn you. You get out of here and get your civilian discharge. And you go into the Veterans Administration. And you try to get any benefits out of that VA. Forget it, he said. You, he said, I, he said, I want you to go in to the hospital. I said, fine, I'm not in a hurry to get back to Galesburg, Illinois. And uh, that was where I was going to open the supermarket. And he said, uh, I want you to go over with a fine tooth nail, to be gone over. And uh, fine tooth nail, fine tooth comb, I don't remember what the hell the expression is. And he said, I want you to get absolutely checked out. He said, uh, was there anything bothering you in prison camp? I says, well, I had several colds. Uh, I said, uh, how, uh, I said, how, and I said, I did. My neck hurt quite a bit while I was in prison camp, and the doctor over there said it was just a, uh, he said, a Nazi doctor? I said, no, a, 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 a POW doctor, but he was a South African. He says, well, I don't know about South Africa and their medical standards, he says, but I'm going to tell you something. I want you to go over your neck and back area with a fine tooth comb. That's it, a fine tooth comb. And he said, uh, I want everything to be checked over perfectly, because once you're out, you ain't getting back in. Well, that man, whoever he is, and I don't know whether he's still living today, and I doubt it because he was an older man, he said, uh, he said, uh, uh, I want you to go back in there, get it all checked out, and then if you're satisfied, you can get your ruptured duct. But he says, not until. So he said to me, uh, so I went back into the hospital. And the same guy that took care of me when I had pneumonitis as a cadet, and I was locked in there for some, for some time, as we had a... Uh, when we had a, uh, but the, the, we were uh, quarantined, the whole hospital for somebody had measles somewhere. At any rate, uh, the same doctor with the same ward said, my God, where did you come from? And I said, out of the bowels of hell. And I told him my story. He says, well, we're certainly going to get busy on you, Lieutenant Bob, because that's ridiculous. He says, you're that staff sergeant who was absolutely right. And I said, have you been here this entire time? He says, yes, yes. Didn't leave the war. Two men, two men, they meet in this ward in 1943. Then they meet again in 1945. And look what happened in the two years between one and the other. One led a little common life taking care of guys coming into the ward for some reason or other. And here is the guy that's been in missions, been in ditch, prison camp, parish, you name it. He says, what a life you've led. So I went to the x-ray, got a million x-rays, and this is the weekend before Yom Kippur. And so in the meantime, I went, uh, after this was all done, I got a Yom Kippur leave and went to Houston, of all places, for a uh, Yom Kippur with the wine gardens. At that time, 50 some odd years ago, whatever it was, they had a chain of supermarkets, wine garden. And of course, they're gone and their son has whatever sold out, I did, there's no wine gardens left in Houston. And uh, so anyway, I went down there and I came back and the guy's looking at me and he says, you come on into my office. I went into his office. He says, you have got one rough situation here. You are going to have to have surgery. 
he said, I want you to go down and see the guy at the uh, orthopedic department. So I went down to see this guy. He says to me, you've got a bunch of smashed vertebrae down there and we're going to have to fuse them together. And he said, uh, so I said, well, okay, fine. And he says, you're very lucky. The guy is, is going to do the job as the head of orthopedics here. He said, and he's a general. So I said, okay, fine. So in the meantime, I go back to the ward and I'm crying. I'm bawling, you know. And so uh, one of the guys in the ward, we were officers, captains, first lieutenants, didn't make a goddamn bit of difference. You were in that ward, the same ward that we were as GIs waiting to become uh, officers. So uh, what happened is that, uh, what are you crying for? And the guy says to me, I said, because I said I'm going to have to have surgery, my neck's going to be fused. So the guy takes a pin and he shoves it in my thumb and I jump about 20 feet and he says, you don't have any surgery until such a time is that you put a, uh, a pin in your thumb and nothing happens. And I said, but there's a, there's a general waiting to operate on me. He said, blank the general, he says, he ain't going to operate on you. I said, I, he, I said, hey, that's fine with me, fellas. So I went down to the general and I said to him, sir, I said, I respectfully say that I don't want to be operated on. He says, okay. He says, we'll put you up for retirement. <laughs> and I look at him like he's crazy. And I says, but I've only been in around four years. He says, it don't make any difference. He says, you're, re you're going to be retired. He says, we can't, we can't just throw you out. And you're not a GI, so we can't throw you out for, uh, with a few dollars disability. He says, you're, a, you're a, an officer. And he says, under the terms of the, of the uh, uh, military code, you, ha you, must be re you must be retired for disability. If you're eligible. So, sure enough, went down, signed up for a reading. You want an attorney? No, I don't want an attorney. And uh, well, he said, uh, fine. He says we'll schedule you for a retirement hearing. So in the meantime, I read in the Stars and Stripes, which was the mag, which was the newspaper of the Air Force, of the Armed Forces, that if you were eligible for uh, promotion before you were shot down as a POW, you were eligible to be promoted. So I went and got the forms for uh, promotion as a, as a uh, POW and filled it all out and sent it in and then applied for 30 days leave because I didn't want to get caught on a, where my promotion would come through after the uh, uh, to, to, to retirement proceedings. Obviously, you get more money as a retired captain than you do as a retired first lieutenant. And uh, so anyway, the, uh, incidentally, this is not all of your father's doing. This is your father. There are latrine lawyers in every group of people in the world, you know. There's, there's another name for him, but I, uh, all right, let's call it a shithouse lawyer. 